An electric mousetrap. This one is branded rent kill, but in reality, it's made by Victor. And apparently that's part of the, it's branded Woodstream and it's an American company, but made in China. Let me explain how you're supposed to use this. It has a battery compartment. I've already put some batteries into it. Open the battery compartment and insert four AA batteries as directed. Close the compartment. I have to say, initially I tried it with any loops. It does not like the lower voltage of nickel metal hydrides. It starts flashing the battery warning indicator. So the ones I've put into it are Juggy or Juggy, um rechargeables that put out 1.5 volts because they've got a lithium battery and a, a buck circuit in them. Open the main compartment, place in a small smear of peanut butter on the inside back of the trap under the ventilation holes. Right, okay, let me uh, let me put this cover back in the battery compartment. If you get one of these, there's this little ribbon for the batteries. I really strongly recommend making sure it's in place before you put the batteries in because it's very hard to get the bottom batteries out if you don't do that. So let's get this closed. So here's the trap compartment. And there's two metal plates here. You put the peanut butter down here where it can be sniffed through these holes and that encourages the mouse to go in and try and find the peanut butter on the other side of those holes. And when it does, it's got a maze in here. It's designed to stop you poking your fingers in. It's also designed to stop the mouse backing out easily. But uh, mice being mice, they can get their way in there. If I put my finger in like that, I can touch one of the electrodes. But... Um, you need to bridge both to actually get the zap. And this has loads of safety interlocks. There's also a little uh, cover here that when it's closed down, there's also a safety interlock there. It makes a sort of more complex route. The mouse really has to squeeze in and it will get trapped between this and the electrodes and that will probably help with the zapping. I wondered what this was for until I saw another model that had a couple of little wires coming down from this. I'm not sure. They may have been a sort of designed to... Stop it back out, I'm not really sure. Um, you place the trap where mice have been seen, preferably in a discreet location. Make sure that the entrance hole is against the wall. Turn the unit on. And when you turn the unit on, listen to this. A green light will flash. Green light flashes. Listen. Did you hear that slight buzz from it? It buzzes to... Presume I wondered if it was charger capacitor or something else. I've not been able to test that because the safety circuits stop you measuring in here. However, I did put various resistors across it. And initially when I uh, powered that up, I, can I show you this? I'm, I'll take the, we'll bypass the safety circuits. That's the best bet. But the idea is that when a mouse comes in, it detects it across these plates. And when it does detect it, it zaps it at the same at a high frequency for about 20 seconds and then it starts flashing the light because by that time apparently the mouse is deceased. It is no longer mousy. I'm not sure the science behind that. I'm not sure why the mice are so decisively killed in that way but um, I guess they probably did a lot of research into that. Let's open it. Some of you will want to see mice die. I'm, well, A, I don't have mice around here and I'm not really into showing things dying and neither is YouTube, apparently, because um, there's another channel called um, Sean Woods and I shall provide a link to this trap in use on that channel and it will show uh, the mouse being zapped. But I'm going to have to show you the early videos in this channel because the militants obviously campaigned against this channel and had it demonetized until he masked the site of a uh, mouse traps operating which is a bit of a thing for a channel which is all about mouse traps so here we have the circuitry let's zoom down on this i'm gonna to have to take this out there's the micro switch for safety uh, when you close this flap it actually causes a little cantilever here on the lid to rock over I'm seeing a 220 ohm resistor. I'm seeing a zener diode. I'm seeing a crystal. I think we should... Well, tell you what, let's bypass the safety circuitry, right? Let's just hold this switch down. And I shall place this row of four neons across that uh, electrode pad in there. I might have to do it the other way up. Am I going to have to do it the other way up? Let's try and get this uh, to make a connection. Is that going to work? No, it's not. One moment. I'm just, uh, maybe I should rehearse these things beforehand. Yeah, that that is a bit too stable. Oh, that's that's not working. 
that's not working either. Tell you what, let's just straighten these out and just wedge them at an angle against that. God, I'm screwing everything up now, haven't I? I think that's probably going to make a connection. <clears throat> let's uh, hold down this safety bypass switch and switch this on. And the neon's light. So it's a fairly high voltage. Now, what if I was to get a pair of long nose pliers, uh, long nose pliers, and just lift that out, uh, and then put a resistor with a value of uh, I'm not really sure. I shall look at the value afterwards. Oh, actually, I've just had to put, take my finger off the safety circuit. Let's try that again. Is it going to energize? I'm going to have to turn it off. I'm going to have to reset it again. When you uh, open the lid, you have to turn the switch off and on to reset it. So initially it buzzes. If I put this across... As soon as it detected that resistor, it turned it on. I can see sparks jumping off the resistor to the pliers. Uh, okay... What, that, what was the value of that? That was... Hold on, let's... Uh, get this under the scope I can't even see that colour band uh, grey red orange that's uh, 82k that's quite a high resistance so I'm not sure how this detects, uh, we're going to have to suck it out and find out, so I'm going to have to zoom out in this and uh, we'll find out what we can see, I've just suddenly realised that while I was poking in there you probably didn't see much because uh, it was uh, not really good for the lighting so I shall take this out. I shall probably remove the batteries. That seems like a good idea because uh, this thing does contain rather spicy voltages. Oh, the battery circuit board looks like it comes out. Let's get that battery out and this one out. And pull the little tab up to release the other batteries. Crucial things. Is this going to slide out now or is this wedged in? Is it screwed in? I don't think it's screwed in. We shall find out. I shall take another screw out. I would guess it's AC. I, you know that I didn't check that. I should have checked, did uh, both sides of the neons light? If it was just one side, it would have been DC. But if it was both sides, it would have been AC. So let's um, get this open and lift the circuit board up. Oh, that is a big transform on the bottom. That is not what I was expecting. Not what I was expecting at all. It's a big transformer. I think that's a transformer. It looks like it. Okay, right. Uh, this is going to be a bit hard to take to bits. Right, tell you what, give me a moment. No, no, what the heck, I'll just do it right now. This is the point of this channel, isn't it? We're supposed to take things to bits. The use of what I'm guessing is just a big chunky transformer here, a ferrite core with wire wrap around it, is probably because it has to deliver fairly high current. It's not like a super high frequency uh, coil. It will deliver high current and it will do it at fairly low frequency. I'm going to get a wallop off this. I don't, I don't see any big capacitors knocking about. I see a ferrite core and then the loads of tape and they've got the windings wrapped around it. We'll maybe take a look under that. It will probably never work again. Once I've done that, let's see if this comes out. It does. Okay. This is all looking fairly good. Whoa, it's complex in the back. I was expecting a microcontroller. Tell you what, I'm going to uh, do a little bit of reverse engineering on this and I'll take some pictures of the circuit board and then we can take a look at it. Lots of reverse engineering later because that was quite an unusual circuit. It had me, it had me wondering at times. There are some strange quirks, but they seem to be mainly to protect the circuitry from the fact that it's got quite a high voltage spiky transformer based on this ferrite core. The ferrite core, incidentally, has two windings. It has a low resistance winding in the region of about one ohm, and then it's got a much higher impedance winding of about uh, one point seven k which is the high voltage output winding. And if you take a look at this, maybe you won't see this. 
there's a super fine winding coming off this and going into this well anchored red wire. That's the high voltage wire going out. They've used a ferrite core as a transform because it's one of the easiest ways to make a customizable transform in this application. It's the easiest to wind and it's the easiest to source, I suppose, ultimately, and get the separation because it's been done very retro style with layers of tape uh, between uh, sets of windings. <clears throat> very functional. It's doing exactly what they want. So here is the circuitry. There is the top of the circuit board. There are It's a single-sided board, but there are seven links in this side. Notably, this black one here, this insulated one that takes quite a convoluted path across the board. Um, I've flipped this, which is why the text is all the wrong way around on this one, because I flipped it to match this one. If you want to take a quick snapshot and uh, try and reverse engineer this yourself, uh, although I don't super recommend that, as you will find out. So it's based on a microcontroller. The microcontroller is a generic one-time programmable device. It's quite cheap. It's got the fanciful name EM78P173N7014J. That is so easy to remember, not really. But it is a generic microcontroller. It's got a crystal and it's got a couple of decoupling capacitors here going to ground the decoupling, the load capacitors for that crystal as a time reference. There are two other chips on board here. Well, three if you include the voltage regulator. The voltage regulator here is very odd. It's a 4.4 volt regulator. I'm guessing that they just chose that because it let them... I, I don't know why they chose that, to be honest. It's very odd choice of regulator. I was expecting 3.3. Oh, yes, I know why they've done it. 4.4. It's because there's a sort of very crude improvised level shifter here. There's a 4069, which is the level sh level shifter. And there's a LM358, which is a dual op amp. But I only think one side is being used. It's monitoring the battery voltage. Unfortunately, when you power this unit up, it makes that buzzing noise. It's not actually doing anything other than testing the batteries when it does that. It's putting them under load and then it uses a reference from the battery supply going to this voltage divider and a reference from the fixed voltage from the 4.4 volt regulator to determine if the voltage is high enough in the batteries to operate. And unfortunately, 4.8 volts is the point that it cuts down. That's what I test it at offload, underload, if the voltage drops down slightly, and that could even be in the tracks because there's a fairly long route, then ultimately it makes it a bit incompatible with nickel metal hydride cells. It's going to do that test at the beginning and then it's going to deem them unsatisfactory and it's going to start flashing its red battery light indicator. The LN358 is quite odd because it's only used at that power up to check the battery and to cut the power consumption of the whole circuit. The microcontroller actually powers that from one of its output pins just to turn it on and then check the signal back the whether it's the battery level's high enough or low enough. When the power comes in from the batteries, it goes via these two diodes first. Initially, I thought this diode here was feeding the logic circuitry and that diode there was feeding maybe the high current uh, coil. It's not. But there is a thing, it's basically isolating the supply via these diodes. It's very strange, with reference to the drive circuitry for them, which this is 4069. Um, we shall look at that later. The switch here, when you turn it on and off at the uh, switch here, uh, it physically switches that between the logic circuitry between positive and negative. The reason for that is that when you turn it off, by switching it to negative, it discharges this power supply capacitor really quickly. It's a good generous capacitor for stability. And that means the processor does an instant reset when you turn it off. When this switch is not made, when the cover of the unit is up and the safety interlock is activated, it kills power not just to the actual coil, uh, which is connected down here, but it kills power to all the circuitry completely, um, which is interesting. So um, let's take a look at the schematic. I've not got the full schematic, just the bits that really matter. Notably that big MOSFET up there, which is a 600 volt MOSFET. Um, it's a K10A60D. That's It's rated for 10 amps continuous, 60, uh, 600 volts, and uh, it can handle 40 amp peaks. In reality, it won't see anything like the 10 amp peak. So here is how it goes. When you turn on, the CPU drives the MOSFET. Because the CPU has a 4.4 volt rail, it needs something to shift the level to the 
roughly about six volts, the, the full battery voltage that the uh, circuitry is running at. So it uses a six gate uh, inverter and it uses it as a level shifter. So by going to the first gate, it converts that because it goes above the threshold of the CMOS for turning that on. It can drive that chip. That inverter then drives all the others in parallel to get enough current to reliably switch the MOSFET on and off quickly. The MOSFET switches the coil. The coil has a low resistance winding. I measured it round about, it, well, one ohm. It's very hard to measure when you get down to that level without cracking out the specialist low resistance test equipment. But it's basically pulling it from the six volt reel down to ground. And uh, that induces a magnetic field in the core which produces high voltage across this very fine winding. And that high voltage is applied across these plates. Normally, with respect to ground, it will find its way back to ground through the mouse uh, via this 220 ohm power resistor just to limit peak current for the potential circuitry and uh, then a Zener diode here. When it's not zapping mice, when it's waiting for the mouse to step on the mat, it actually detects it by the current flowing through this coil across the mouse, its little moist feet. Oh, that sounds so harsh when I say it like that. Through this, that would clamp it down to the sort of maximum voltage. It doesn't really matter this scene will be above the supply rail voltage probably because uh, it's normally seeing quite a spiky voltage, about 1,000 volts or so. And uh, that, uh, when the high voltage isn't there, the current's flowing through the mouse, through this resistor, and then there's a bit of filtering through this capacitor through another very high value resistor to limit the current. The reason for that is that, you know, it's it's all about avoiding spikes from the high voltage side of things damaging the circuitry. It then goes, uh, there's a 10 meg ohm pull down resistor and they really have, they've been playing safe in some weird ways. Then another bit of filtering this capacitor and then there's a diode going up to the plus six volt rail, the battery rail and down to the zero volt rail. And that means that if the voltage on the input pin to the microcontroller exceeds six volts, that diode will clamp it. And if it ex ex exceeds the negative rail, this diode will clamp it. The same, these diodes are normally found inside the microcontrollers, which is a bit strange because the microcontroller itself is a 4.4 volt rail. So if there is a spike in that, the diodes in here will clamp it first, but they've just used a belt and braces approach. And that's more or less it. So it detects the current flowing through the mouse, through the circuit, which is just super limited. It's a very sensitive input in the microcontroller, just purely uh, by doing that, they've avoided any of the high voltage potentially affecting that, particularly because it's clamped here anyway. But it means the same two pads can be used to sense when the mouse is on them, particularly if it's little moist feet actually make contact. I guess they must have done a lot of testing for that. Is there anything else worth mentioning about this circuitry? Apart from the extreme belts and braces approach, the slightly ungenerous uh, voltage threshold, uh, what else is there to say? Not a lot. It really is diodes everywhere because they really have been, they've been trying to protect the microcontroller for any, from any problems. Um, and local filtering here as well with that capacitor. Everything is filter, filter, diodes, diodes everywhere because of this high voltage transformer to stop it affecting the circuitry and just keep it stable, which makes absolute sense. So there it is. It's actually really simple. You turn it on. It initially energizes the coil as a series of spikes. Doesn't, uh, try and charge capacitor or anything like that. So there's a high voltage across those pads initially. It will be doing, that's it doing a self-test. It's checking the batteries. It may also be checking for contaminants because if the two pads had a, a slight dirt across them, if there was a residue, that could act as a resistance and that could cause false triggering. So it probably detects that as well. And if it doesn't, uh, doesn't work properly, one of the things they recommend is just in that area, give it a good clean out. And in a newer version of this, the two parts actually physically detach so you can unclip one and clean it out completely. But um, that's where, you know, residual bait and stuff like that could actually cause problems. So it's interesting. I'm guessing the rather aggressive voltage threshold is the humane bit because it's basically checking at power up. Do I have enough power to actually kill the mouse completely and not leave it having a horrible lingering death? But that said, um, I'm not sure how, if you watch the video I'm linking to below, Sean Wood's video, um, Mouse Trap Monday, you'll see that it has a fairly instant effect. But um, 
I wouldn't say that electrocution is the nicest way to kill anything, really. But the mice seem very susceptible to a very short and sustained shock here. It only lasts for about 20 seconds when, when it detects that something has bridged those contacts. But there we go. It's actually really well made. It's physically well made. The assembly is quite, you know, it looks quite expensive. It's, it doesn't look like it was just banged out of factory cheaply. It looks like a lot of manual work went into making the transformers and everything is belt and braces. They've not skimped in the circuitry. So I have to say that the Victor mousetrap, it's, a, it's getting a technical win from me because it is actually built really well. It's an interesting device, but I don't have any mice to test it on. This is probably good because I'd feel so guilty. But there we go. It's very well made. It's a very neat device indeed.